Hi, my name is Sonia Gracchi, and I am the director of the Institute for Hospitality and Tourism Research at the Ted Rogers School of Management. This Pecha Kucha presentation is about the recent book chapter published by myself and Dr. Pat Mayer from Cape Breton University that can be found in the Handbook of Islands edited by Godfrey Pralicino. Islands are special places. They have clear borders and a coastline that encloses them within a body of water. This condition makes island spaces relatively easy to mentally grasp and understand, which in turn makes humans feel secure. This is what fuels and drives the worldwide fascination of and with islands. People travel to indulge in the island experience, including visiting communities that are isolated and displaying rich and diverse cultures, unique environmental attributes and exotic species, or just lingering carelessly at a sandy beach. Islands in tropical and lower temperate latitudes typically enjoy a climate where mainly beach and coastal tourism unfolds over an extended season and where a heavy dose of tourism visitations are not subject to dizzy seasonality spikes. In contrast, cold water islands lying at higher temperate and subarctic or Antarctic latitudes offer close encounters with a wild, starker and a more raw and rugged experience of nature for lower numbers of tourists, typically during a narrow window of opportunity. Therefore, environmental and social impacts are likely to be more prevalent on warm water islands. The situation is generally different in cold water islands as there are more regulations governing the development of tourism and related infrastructure, while tourism numbers tend to be much lower and so are much more manageable. Tourism tends to bring along some distinct challenges to island locales. These impacts will loom larger with a decreasing size of the island territory and or the size of its resident population. First, there is a real risk of a very rapid saturation of an island as a tourism destination. Once discovered and placed on the tourist trail, an island may find itself overwhelmed by progressively larger numbers of visitors. Hospitality and welcoming behavior may quickly turn to disgust and irritation, which can then threaten the sustainability and future of the tourism industry of any small island. Coastal areas may experience considerable erosion and degradation. Rare and endemic species risk habitat loss or disturbance. Second, many small island economies can become totally enamored of and gripped by the tourism industry to the exclusion or detriment of any other serious alternative productive activity. A high profile crime, murder or terrorist act can however dangerously send such an economy into a nosedive overnight. A recovery from such a mishap can take years. Islands are often dependent on foreign investment. Small island businesses that are owned by foreigners may not contribute as much to the local economy. Third, and unless connected by fixed links, tourism visitation to islands depends exclusively on sea and or air connections. Seaports, ferry and cruise ship terminals and airports, all of which are typically located at or near the island's capital city and main urban area, become the arrival and departure points de rigueur of all tourists. Such situations, rural and remote areas, in single island units or out in outlining islands tend to miss out on the tourism action and may be agitated to redress what they consider as an unfair marginality. Sustainable island living often requires the active participation of and by local people in the development and management of tourism. In addition, a carefully designed and long-term strategic tourism plan, intensive capacity building, and the training of both national public officials and private sector management are needed to minimize the environmental and social impacts of tourism on small islands. We have situated this chapter within a warm water and cold water division, and thus we chose one case study which fits in each of these two general categories. In addition, we felt that it was critical to explore destinations that have some defining similarities, and in doing so, we chose to examine Gili Terangan in Indonesia and Cape Breton in Canada. The island of Gili Terangan is primarily focused on dive and party tourism and has attracted small-scale tourism since the 1980s. Due to its limited access to main tourist areas such as Bali, it was mainly a destination for backpackers. Much of the development into the late 1990s was small-scale, local establishments and developer tourists, visitors who decided to stay on the island and open a dive shop. The strength of the community in Gili Terangan, which is an island entirely dependent on tourism, has been manifested in an organization that is meant to develop initiatives to protect the island's fragile resource base. The Gili Eco Trust, or GET, was established by the island's expatriate manager dive shops in 2002 as a not-for-profit initiative prompted by the looming destruction of the coral reefs due to global warming, untreated waste, uncontrolled tourism activities, and destructive fishing practices. The GET effect suggests that people on islands can become resourceful in terms of ensuring 
their resources are utilized to their full capabilities, and yet that these resources are sustained so that the tourism industry is not destroyed. When local island communities mobilize in this and similar ways to protect their resources and sustain their tourism industry, there is hope that challenges can be addressed at the local level rapidly and effectively. The next case study discussed in this chapter is Cape Breton. Cape Breton Island is located in the North Atlantic Ocean on the eastern coast of Canada. It is part of Nova Scotia and is separated from the mainland peninsula by the Strait of Canso. Historically, there are three distinct groups in the population of Cape Breton Island, Scottish Gaelic, French Acadian, and Mi'kmaq, the local indigenous population. After centuries in relative isolation, these three cultural braids were joined more recently by migrating black loyalists escaping the USA, Italians, and Eastern Europeans. The latter groups all settled primarily in industrial Cape Breton to work in the coal and steel industries. The evolution of tourism on Cape Breton Island can be seen largely as an alternative trajectory to extractive resource industries on the island. Through the 19th and 20th centuries, the coal fields of, the industrial, of industrial Cape Breton supported some of the largest private employers in Canada. There were numerous mines employing entire towns, and so the need for additional industries, apart from those that service the mines, was simply not there. Since the Second World War, tourism on Cape Breton has been mainly scenic cruising, focused on driving along the spectacular Cabot Trail, a world-class highway completed initially in 1932 that loops 300 kilometers around the northern tip of the island. With its recognizable scenic vistas, the Cabot Trail is an attraction on its own, but it also connects other important tourism attractions. Tourism in Cape Breton has always had some level of reliance on other development via well-paying jobs. The tourism industry saw visitors coming and going, and infrastructure investment, but not really much, much interest in working in the industry. Now, without the steel and coal industries, there is widespread unemployment and poverty, yet still not much interest in working in the service industry of tourism due to the expectation of higher wages. There is also a nearly emergent suite of social problems as Cape Bretoners have started to move for work, either on a week-to-week -week basis, flying in and out for work, or for weeks at a time, or moving permanently, which causes the population of the island to further decline. The movement is not sustainable, nor is the reliance on high-paying resource development jobs out elsewhere. There is also a lot of fragmentation in the industry. Large attractions appear to do well, especially when they piggyback off the cruise ship growth, but for, for the free independent traveler, there are many missing pieces to the sector. Many in the industry believe that Cape the destination Cape Breton, the regional DMO, only wants to promote the Celtic heritage angle, and there are many other small but significant issues such as no shuttle service, poor opening hours of downtown businesses, and nothing available on Sundays that plague the sector. In any case, the people of Cape Breton are seen as friendly and welcoming, resilient to changing situations, and living in a landscape that is familiar to many, yet awe-inspiring in its own right. For Cape Breton to truly be sustainable and world-class, it needs to fix a somewhat disjointed industry and match expectation with experience. Keep the down-home charm, let lose, lose the down-home headaches, such as lack of shops and restaurants on Sunday and poor shuttle services. Although not necessarily unique to islands, most of the challenges faced by Gili Turangan and Cape Breton are heightened because of their geographic nature. Due to their size and isolation, historical marginalization, and resource limitations, islands can face significant challenges to the sustainable de development of their tourism industry. Yet there are some extraordinary coping mechanisms in place. The resourcefulness of island people showcases their disposition to be resilient and necessary adaptation to fast-changing environments. While islands are geographically bounded, given the right kind of people, sound policies, and sufficient support, they may know no bounds. Island tourism is volatile, but with the right structure in place, it can be resilient and successful in spite of this volatility. The sustainability of island tourism, whether in cold water or warm water locations, has seen many success stories. Destinations such as Gili Turangan and Cape Breton offer both cautionary tales and reasons for cautious optimism.